would you love for your career to really be something non-traditional? And do you secretly wish that you could make more money than you ever really thought possible? Watch this episode of The Money and You Show and learn how. Your relationship with money matters. I'm Michelle Perkins, and this is The Money and You Podcast, where I will be breaking down your relationship with money, offering tough love money tips, and a money dating plan that will focus on lifting the barriers to success to help pave the way for better money practices and increased wealth. It's time to take control to live a limit-free life. It starts today. Hello, hello, and welcome to The Money and You Show. I'm Michelle Perkins, your host. We have such a great show for you today. We're gonna get into several different areas. Uh, for you career changers, we're gonna talk about moving into some non-traditional areas and really having all kinds of fulfillment and satisfaction and big money from that kind of thinking. And we're going to help the entrepreneurs in our audience with some really amazing digital marketing information and other things. And we're gonna, of course, talk about money. And I'm gonna bring our excellent uh, guest on uh, with this quick introduction. Stephen Mark Cahan has successfully helped grow seven startup companies from early stage to going public or being sold, resulting in $5 billion in shareholder value. Stephen is the author of the Amazon bestseller, Be a Startup Superstar. Stephen's newest book is called High Velocity Digital Marketing. He lives in Texas with his wife, and I am very happy to have him here actually for a second time. Uh, before we were doing the Money and You show, we had the Limit Free Life show, and Stephen was a guest there talking about his his multi-dimensional career and, and success in uh, working in startups and how you can do that. So we're gonna get into that a little bit today, but you can go back to that show as well. I'll put it in the show notes and you can hear him again on a different show. So welcome, Stephen. I'm so happy that you've come back. It is very nice to be back with you, Michelle. Thank you. There is a lot to talk about in uh, not long enough amount of time. So we're gonna jump in. And I'd love it if you just start with kind of that. I, I love the story about what your your parents told you would be a really good idea for you in terms of a career and then where you took that. So if you could start there, I'd love that. Yeah, for sure. So like so many of your listeners, I, I just remember when I was growing up, my father used to tell me to uh, go to school, get your degree, work hard, go to work for a large corporation. And if you work hard, they'll take care of you. Eventually you'll have a great career and, and all good things would happen. And so that was really the path that I took. And so I graduated college, uh, made my parents proud, I guess, <laughs> and uh, went to work for a large corporation. And I remember staring at my bank statement one morning and the pile of claims that I needed to process that day uh, and wondering how on earth would I ever get ahead? And I'd work these incredibly long hours and the student loans seemed to grab a hold of my paycheck before uh, I, I really even had any money left. And so uh, for me, what I, quickly realized, and, and part of my aha moment was uh, when I asked myself a very simple question, which was, can I earn a great living and love the work that I do? And just by that question and searching for answers, I realized that for me, that it wasn't going to be that traditional corporate route that I was far more entrepreneurial and I wanted to have a chance to uh, do really everything. And, and so it would be really a small company, a startup where I get that opportunity. And that was the path that I took. And, and quite frankly, I've, I've never looked back and I, I, I've loved literally every minute of it. Hmm. I love that. And I love the early insight that you had into where this path financially was going to take you and some of the limitations there, because that has been, you know, the advice your parents gave um, was the same advice, you know, that everybody's parents gave in those days. And it made sense. I mean, it had worked for people. And so we live in quite a different world today. Um, and 
I think it's important that we think differently. And I, I think there's still a lot of people obviously giving that advice. And sometimes I think, I'd love your insight on this. I don't think it's a bad idea to go that route initially and get a little big company experience, but what are your thoughts on that? Well, what what I found for me was that, uh, first of all, I, I needed to find that zone of, of greatness, that one area that I could focus in on and and really get a chance to to mess up and to uh, experience a, a broad spectrum. And, and for me, that was marketing. It was really a, a passion of mine. And I didn't want it to be limited to just a certain silo of marketing. I felt that if I was ever gonna build my uh, expertise in a deep way, and, and I'm a firm believer that the world pays for deep expertise. And then once you have that, then it's more of the general general knowledge that that was uh, really uh, uh, the path that I felt I could maximize my income and, and really enjoy the process. But I think even more important is that what I've learned over many years is that it's a funny thing. It's like you, if you work for an organization and you get your base salary and some sort of bonus, uh, it, it's really tough to get ahead. Even if you do well and you continue to increase that base salary and that bonus, because it's it's you get married, you buy new cars, you go on vacations, and it's like you you spend almost in accordance with that extra money that you make, and so. I think one of the keys about startup companies is that is stock options. And for me, if there would have been no way that financially I would have had anywhere near the level of success that I have been so blessed to achieve if it weren't for stock options. Now, certainly you've got to pick the right startup, but uh, but that really is part of the secret sauce and the game changer, that if the company succeeds, you could succeed in a big way too. And that has really been in largely responsible for changing the trajectory of, of the earnings that I've, I've been blessed to, to achieve. Yeah, thank you. Very, very interesting. And uh, so you had that moment where you decided to make a change. Did you know right away that going in the direction of working for startups was what you would do, or did did that? How did that come about? I knew right away that that those types of environments, particularly when I would meet some of the entrepreneurs and listen to their stories and listen to the passion of where they wanted to take the company, that that absolutely was the type of situation, and and more importantly, the type of people that at least my uh, my value s system really uh, would resonate with. So I saw that uh, early on. Now, what I also see is that a lot of people are concerned about taking that path because they perceive that the startup world is too risky. Mm -hmm. And I made every mistake. I sort of maybe lucked out a little bit with the, with the first startup. But what I've learned is actually what you would look for within a startup companies where you could start to separate a startup that has a good story versus one that has a, a good story as well as a good chance to succeed. Mm -hmm. And it's really within those criteria that, uh, that those seven companies that you made reference to uh, when you introduced me that I have I have selected those and worked around a lot of smart people and and we probably caught a few breaks a along the way and and achieved great success. Mm, I love that. And I think um, you know you talk quite a bit in your earlier book about how to you know w what the criteria is if you're looking to go into a startup and sort of how to make those decisions with some good filtering. Um, when you know you went you had these seven experiences that struck me because clearly you didn't stick around after you know with each one you moved on and so what was what was happening there what was the impetus to to continue to yeah change? so uh, so at, at these companies i've been uh been on management team at, at each of the companies and 
like if you just take the the last company that I was with, I mean, it's a good a good sort of microcosm for for why I I certainly didn't stick around. But so the company when I joined, it was about five million in revenue. Uh, it just got uh, an influx of venture capital. It had two quarters in a row in which revenue had flatlined, however, and uh, and so this amazingly bright future in this cybersecurity with a kind of funny name by the name of Thycotic. <laughs> Sounds a little bit like psychotic, I realize. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so we came in, we restored revenue growth literally within a quarter. We hit our numbers every quarter for five years. Uh, and uh, and then eventually got to 145 million, leading to that 1.4 billion dollar exit that we had achieved uh, last year. And when you grow a company like that, and you go for that ride, and and the the close knit team that uh, that you sort of build, and then that culture that you build uh, uh, for, in our case, for example, like we would never get stuck. Uh, in too much analysis paralysis, we were we 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 would make quick decisions. Uh, the team really liked one another. Is that when um, you get acquired, uh, things change, and that's good, right? That's part of uh, the growth to the next company. But you put so much into it, uh, into the growing of a company, because it's it may seem like that growth from five million to one hundred forty five million was just always up and to the right, and it's. Uh, no challenges along the way, but there were a ton of them. And so you 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 exit, you feel like you've achieved great success, and then that company is not the same, right? And so it's good that it's not the same, but it's it's hard to stick around in those scenarios, at least for me. And so then I start thinking typically, all right, well, what's the next great challenge to go grow a company and and have the same type of outcome so for me i i rarely stayed on past a year and when when our company has been acquired very interesting i i find that interesting because i i have a little of this in myself and then i talk to clients who i'm coaching sometimes and they have this the same kind of feeling that something is very exciting when there's a team going for something and you want to reach that goal, then you get, you know, you reach the goal and all of a sudden you kind of feel done, like ready to move on to something new. And I don't know if that's, you know, if they're just, if, if, if that's your personality or, or you can identify that as a personality type. Um, but yeah, I think that that is, uh, more common than not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, and it's why a lot of times when uh, a company is being acquired, they'll build in uh, retention into keeping the management team because they know uh, they might have been through this themselves, that that is a natural reaction that that executives in, in the previous or other people in the previous company uh, have. And so uh, I think it's, it's, it's actually not a bad thing because if you stick around long enough to make sure, as I always do, that the transitions are are uh, successful, because a lot of acquisitions, they look great in Excel, but then they don't work so well in the real world. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the results are a little disappointing. And so I, I've not seen that uh, in in the scenarios that I've been in because uh, you had like a team stick around for a period of time and and then you realize it's 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 time to move on. So I think it's uh, it's not a bad thing at all. And I think it's it's natural. Yeah, I, I love that that you're saying it's not a bad thing, because sometimes people do feel like there's something wrong with them because they just they want something they go after it, they get it. And then, you know, they're just. Yeah. And then the new challenge. company needs to build its own identity. Right. And mm -hmm. so. Uh, like sometimes, uh, you know, I wouldn't be this way, but I think sometimes people are resistant to assimilate into a new company and its mission and and its culture, which needs to be developed and unique on its own. And I think that uh, that actually because of that, it's sometimes a good thing, actually, mm -hmm. that the company be allowed to do so. And, you know, people will 
you know, the status quo is, is powerful, right? I mean, people like to, uh, it's, it's predictable, it's comfortable. And so when you're acquired, uh, you know, that status quo needs to change, mm -hmm. right? And you've got to break free from it. And what could make it difficult is if there are people or a group of people that are resistant to that change because they yearn for the good old days. And, yeah. and that is what could cause uh, the, the new company to not achieve at the rate that it had projected that it would. Hmm. Great point. Yeah, very interesting. I want to go back along this journey. And you said there were a couple of quarters that, that in the revenue was flat. Um, because it does sound so exciting to work for a startup, to be part of a team, that, that team thing, it really, I think people hear that and go, wow, you know, that would be so wonderful to have people around me all working together, you know, happily toward the same goal. Money, people have such an emotional relationship with money. So when, you know, when it looks hopeful and everything is, is exciting in that way, uh, people are in a certain emotional state. And then when things are not going so well, think people are in a different emotional state. And so I, I wonder if just for a minute you could talk about, you know, how leadership could deal with this in, in, a, in the, a smart way so that the emotional impact of the financial situation doesn't negatively affect things. Yeah, so obviously money is important, right? And anyone says that it isn't important is is uh, BSing. <laughs> and so that that is certainly a part of it. But there are other things that play into it that are so important. For example, and by the way, these are things that we've always at the companies that I've uh, uh, been so lucky to be a part of, we, we've always had. So th the first thing is, is a clear set of objectives. Right. And not a gazillion and, and one objectives, <laughs> but a limited number of key objectives that the team can align around. And so as someone, for example, that was leading marketing, as well as a few other functions in the last company, I always started every meeting with my marketing team re reviewing where we were from a revenue perspective in any given quarter. <laughs> and so that was uh, what we were all trying to, to, to focus on as the high, high order uh, objective. And so one is a clarity objectives. And then secondly, it's building alignment to those objectives. Mm -hmm. uh, no, and one of the keys to that is making sure that people understand how those objectives apply to them in their role. Because sometimes it might not be as clear, right? And so as a leader, you've got to help make that tie to make sure that everyone on your team really understands that the difference that they can make really matters. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times that doesn't happen. I think another part to that is we like to be super transparent with respect to our progress as a company, where we were, what was working, what wasn't working. And people, sometimes people would complain about, oh, gee, we've got a quarterly meeting. We really don't want to go to that. We're busy. But we were super transparent on where we were going and what we were doing and why it was important in ways that most uh, companies are not. So that really everybody understood what we were doing in the company from the people at the very top to the people uh, at, 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 at the middle or even in the bottom. And then I think another piece of it is that, uh, it, and this is an important piece that is talked about, but rarely done effectively, which is recognizing people for what they uh, deliver to the company and, and recognizing their achievements and accomplishments. Uh, for example, Every quarter when we would have uh, kickoff meetings with the entire company who was invited, uh, what we would do is we would recognize people from around the company where there might be like 15, 16, 17 people who were recognized. Uh, we would tell a little story about what they did that was above and beyond and special. 
we uh, gave them uh, awards along with uh, a, a financial bonus as, as a thank you. And so what we really try to do is make a point of making sure that like great effort was recognized. And so when you are clear about your objectives, you build alignment across everybody within the organization, you're transparent with what's going on so that people aren't like having uh, virtual, I guess, water cooler conversations, trying to figure out what's really happening. And then, uh, uh, and then recognizing people for the great work that they do. It's all of those things that then when combined with, uh, with fair pay, make it a, a special environment, one where uh, people really enjoy. Mm. Thank you. That's a great answer to that question. And really, do you, I, I loved your answer. And, and do you feel like there's more of an effort in that regard in the startup world? Um, I, I know in my day, in traditional corporations, that wasn't happening. But I think there's a bit of an effort I, now, but I do, but I still think it's lagging. I yeah. think it's lagging in companies that I see right there. Uh, and so I, I work with a number of venture capital uh, company portfolio companies. And so th these are things that I try to uh, deliver to them so that they are reminded. Most uh, executives, the things that I just mentioned, none of which is rocket science. Mm -hmm. But it's really paying attention to those core fundamentals and actually doing them, which takes time, right? And so, uh, uh, and it takes effort and attention, but providing that attention, making that effort could make all the difference to having a special company, uh, one where uh, people where retention is high and uh, and people love being there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is really what people are after now. Uh, that's fantastic. So let's talk a little about digital marketing. You are a marketing expert. You've recently written a new book on digital marketing. But what you were saying to me before we started the show, I thought was so interesting. I think anybody who uh, uh, is an entrepreneur out there is going to be very interested in, which is people's the way people buy today and the differences in in today's world. Yeah, and just starting with a few stats, right? So there was a recent McKinsey survey that said eighty three percent of CEOs expect their marketing to drive most of their company's growth. Mm. And according to the Harvard Business Review, roughly, 80% of CEOs are dissatisfied with the return on their marketing investment. And so, so many people in sales and marketing are almost overwhelmed by revenue expectations they can't meet. And so, part of the reason for this is that, as you alluded to, that the way people buy now has totally changed. And buyers now rely on digital content to make purchase decisions. And just a few other stats to back that up. There was, according to Gartner Group, leading analyst firm, um, said that 62% of B2B buyers develop selection criteria for finalizing a vendor list solely based on digital content. Hmm. And 67% of buyers prefer to not interact with a sales representative as their primary source for information. And, you know, think about it, like if you were going to go buy a car right now, you're probably not going to go to like 10 dealers to interact with those 10 dealers sales reps, not anything against them or, or those reps. Like what you're going to do is you're going to go online, you're, you're going to do your homework, you're going to maybe go build a car so you could see what it l might look like and price it out. And um, and then you're going to go to to a dealer, right? And so, what this means is that there's a new level of information parity during the buying process, which has changed the way that that companies need to interact with potential buyers. I mean, buyers are reading they're they're reading Amazon reviews. They're mm. they're looking at 
at how many stars you have, right? And all this information is out there. And so you got to be great online uh, if you want to consistently grow revenue and, and to be able to do that at reasonable cost. Yeah, and it's a big Wild West kind of place to be online. So how, how would you direct someone uh, who's a little lost in that Right, space? and so it's the concept behind high-velocity digital marketing is also like really simple. It's, it's based on the, the faster you convert digital content-based leads into paying customers, the more successful your business. And that time is money. And the single metric that reveals the most about time and money is velocity, but that velocity is overlooked and it's rarely managed, right? And so one of the keys for uh, implementing uh, high velocity digital marketing, like if you take the story of Thycotic, Right. And so I'll just give you give you a, a couple of the keys. Right. And so when I met with the founders and the management team, when I joined and this is when the company was five million and I said, well, gee, tell me who your customers are. And then they said, well, uh, Steve, we're a cybersecurity company. Our our customers are CISOs, the chief information security officers. And um, and so that's who we need to market to. And so I started to do my homework and I started to interview customers and ask them very specific categories of questions. And what I found was that the customers weren't the chief information security officers. They were IT admins hmm. who are the techies living in the trenches who actually are responsible for security as well. So imagine just for a moment, if I was going to market based on the information that I was confidently told by the founders of this $5 million company, right? I, I, I would have been marketing in all the wrong places mm. and I would have been marketing in the wrong way. So for example, the chief information security officers, once I talk to them, they care about that their policies are being followed, that. They care about things like regulatory compliance. They're going to read what the analysts have to say. But the IT admins, they're never going to read an analyst report. They care about what their peers say. They really care about super ease of use and, uh, and just things that would deliver immediate time to value. And there's certain places where they hang out online digitally. And then for our solution, we were focused on a solution that was all about what's known as privileged password security, which is to say that every part of, a, of an organization's infrastructure, operating systems, databases, applications has a password. And if you ask those IT admins, because they were responsible for complex infrastructures, how many privileged passwords would you have, right? And I asked them, and 100% of them had no idea Hmm. Right. So you, you can't manage or secure what you don't even know that you have. So like that then uh, spurred on for me the idea for a free tool, which was a tool that would go discover the passwords that they actually had wow. presented to them in a beautiful report, explain to them the risks that they have all automated. So it didn't require people. We gave them a grade like like university A through F, right? And so like that piece of content was in huge demand. Uh, and it, it, we generated a ton of leads focused on our correct buyer, mm -hmm. right? That's an example of just super simply put of having a strategy that enabled a highly focused digital marketing approach based on a coveted piece of content that, you know, think about in your own lives. If you go online, how often do you give up your name, email address, phone number, et cetera, et cetera? If you're like me, the answer is like almost never, hmm. right? I don't want to be hounded. And so you have to have content that's so compelling that captures people's imagination, your buyer's imagination and their attention so that they're actually willing to give up that personal information 
which is a sales lead, which then starts the whole process uh, and enables you to grow revenue efficiently. Wow, that is very interesting. And I know for, you know, for all the business owners out there, they're struggling to figure out what type of content. And, and I just know from personal experience, me as you know, the head of my own company, I would give myself a very low grade for being able to understand what that piece of content is. Uh, I, so I, I'll tell you how I did it. So I, first of all, spent, and unlike most people responsible for marketing, I spent a lot of my time thinking about the content that our buyers would just live for, <laughs> right? And I was talking to our prospective buyers constantly, right? And so a lot of times people don't do that. And then they, when they do, they almost try to lead those buyers to the solution because it aligns with what they sell. <laughs> and so like, they're not asking questions like around the status quo, right? So oftentimes you don't lose business to a competitor. You lose business to someone just saying, well, gee, what we got is good enough. Mm -hmm. Right. So asking the right questions, uh, which, by the way, I list those questions in my my uh, high velocity digital marketing book that I used to ask. And so it's asking those questions and then really spending enough time to then think about, all right, what would it be like people, for example, uh, when they would get uh, uh, these free tools that we would offer where they would get grades, they'd love it. And then also, they always wanted to know how they compare to their peer group. And because we were collecting information that nobody else in the world had, and we would get people to put in their industry, their geography, the size of company, we were able to then send a report the very next day, which got people into the habit of opening up our emails mm -hmm. of how they compared to their industry peers. And all this was built automatically, right. right? And so, and people love that stuff. But then the other thing that I did was I, I regularly met twice a year with the best and brightest in our company, whether they were in R&D or uh, sales engineering or professional services. And I gave them links to great free tools or great content. And I would give them an assignment that they had to come to the meeting with one great idea. Hmm. And so they all would, and then we would prioritize which one would we think would resonate the best. And then I would have my built-in team of cheerleaders. They'd often help me create that content. And, uh, and so I never had a shortage because of the time that I spent and who it is that I got involved to help me to figure it all out. Uh, and that's how we we had just more content ideas than we could ever actually act on. Hmm. So fascinating. Does the book focus? Well, it, it, I'm sure it focuses on all the areas, but um, you know the the content part I, I'm hearing is the most important piece. But then there's a lot around that. You know what what machinery do you need around that piece of content that is going to actually help reach your buyers and and so Yeah, 100%, 100%. Like so one of the areas is you got to be great in Google, right? And so I mean, the whole world Googles, right? <laughs> yeah. I've done a bunch today myself on a on a <laughs> bunch of things that I'm working on right now. And you, I, I give a number in the book of tips around what you could do to become great. But one of the things is we would regularly track what we called our coveted keywords. These were the keywords that uh, we, as well as our top competitors, were focused in on that generated the most amount of searches in and around what we did. And so I track those keywords and key phrases uh, in, in a, a Google spreadsheet, uh, literally against our top three competitors, where we were like page one or page two, page one, third position, whatever it might be. And so we, we wanted to be great on those. But then 
whenever we were creating a piece of content, we would have our SEO expert meet with the content creator and say, these are the keywords that best apply to that piece of content. And they would meet prior to the creation and they would meet after it, the content piece was ready to go to make sure that we were properly incorporating those. And then once we did, we made sure that that content was exposed to Google such that it could be scanned. And of course, our partners use this as well, which created a number of backlinks because they loved our content. Mm. And so just that simple process, sometimes you get a bunch of gobbledygook from Google experts mm -hmm. and your head starts spinning, but there's just a simple piece of advice that someone could start implementing quickly to uh, to start making their their way up the, the Google board and and become great on Google. Yeah, that is so interesting. And I'm, I love that you brought up the SEO expert because I think a lot of marketing teams are good at uh, the content creation and, and a lot of aspects of this. But what I've found is that uh, website developers and other marketing folks don't always understand SEO and will we'll need you to have an ex SEO expert in addition to... A hundred percent. And then you've got to be great about um, being where your buyers hang out online. So like a great example of this is we wanted to launch a cybersecurity podcast and we had a guy who was great, right? And so, um, but what I didn't want to do was to launch another cybersecurity podcast that nobody was going to listen to, <laughs> that it would take us forever and a day to go build up the type of listenership that we wanted. And so, as I mentioned in a previous answer that our buyers were IT admins. So we partnered with the leading trainer of IT admins around the globe, an organization called Cybrary, <laughs> who delivered IT uh, admin training online and certifications. And so we partnered with them to uh, deliver a cyber a cybersecurity focused podcast that they were super happy to do and wanted to do. And so literally immediately because we partnered with an organization that was tied into our ideal target buyers and already had them that literally within a month, we had one of the largest cybersecurity podcasts around the globe. But that's like being where your buyers are online, which is mm -hmm. key. But then also thinking about innovative ways to get there. Like what I mentioned to you, it didn't cost us a dime. They were thrilled to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, so was it in part your expertise in digital marketing that ended up, I mean, being part of how you grew the last company so much, or where did where did all of this? Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, for sure, right? I mean, uh, so we went through the the teeth of COVID, right? And and it, it, now it's 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 still not a hundred percent away, obviously. But like when COVID hit, like the world was freaked out, and rightfully so. Right. And so uh, and then all the remote work really started to accelerate. Right. And so a lot of the traditional ways of marketing, the face to face events, the sales reps going to go meet with a company at their corporate headquarters, like there wasn't any of that. Yeah. But we didn't skip a beat because our marketing was it was totally focused on connecting with our buyers digitally to begin with, right? And so uh, so this in large part enabled us to accelerate revenue growth, to hit our numbers every quarter. And again, an important component is to do so at reasonable cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. That is a lot of really great information. I, I think it's just, uh, you know, the starting point. And um, I, I really encourage, people to read your book because it is a very confusing world out there with respect to digital marketing and it is it's confusing and then there's like 
there's so much theoretical stuff that you hear where you're again it's like it sounds nice but then you're reading stuff or getting trained and you're like okay what do i do mm -hmm. right and what people want and should expect and deserve is okay what do you do mm -hmm. right and so that's really what this book is about uh because that sort of is how i am right and so yeah. Yeah. uh that's uh, uh that's what people would get should they should they choose to to read read the book well, I love that, and I'll be sure to put uh, that uh, access, the link, in the in the show notes. And thank you so much for all that information. It's it's really interesting, and I think a point of of challenge for for any business owner right now. Um, and it's it's the path to cash. I mean, it really is something that will boost your revenue and make a huge difference for you if you know how to do it and you actually execute on that. So um, I did want to bring up before we part ways, um, you've had this wonderful career with a lot of fulfillment and, you know, learning and financial gain and it, it you really uh, have kind of embodied a, a really wonderful career development process um, and now you're doing some different things and this is part of the whole you know limit free life concept is that you get to move out of you know your normal pathways and, and do different things that you might have always wanted to do and especially given the the financial um, situation that you've been able to build, you're able to to really take advantage of some great opportunities. So can you just tell us a couple of the interesting things that you have going on now? Yeah, well, one of the things that I'm super passionate about is uh, I'm uh, actually an advisor to the American University of Kiev uh, in the Ukraine. And so it's incredible with all the horrific stuff that's going on in Ukraine and in Kiev in particular that here's a university that actually is open right i'm not exactly sure how much the enrollment is but they're they're uh a uh a university that views itself in part responsible for helping to train the next uh round of entrepreneurs mm -hmm. uh and and be part of the catalyst that brings back the ukrainian economy hopefully when all of this mess comes to a conclusion. And so uh, advising them on how to build an accelerator, one that can help a bunch of startup businesses uh, get funding and training and things of that nature. And then just more on a personal level, I've recently partnered with one of uh, James Patterson's co-authors to write a murder mystery. And so that's uh, well in process and it's like been a blast so far. I love that. I, I love, that's fabulous. So congratulations on all of it. And I, I commend you for continuing to find new sources of, of joy and, and passion and, and fun. So that's really what it's about and you're a good example of that. So thank you. Yeah, I completely agree. <laughs> I've been blessed that I'm getting a chance to do some of these other things. Yeah, that's fantastic. So um, can you tell people a couple of ways they can connect with you or find you out there in the big world when they want to Google you? <laughs> sure. So you could find me at my website, which is beastartupsuperstar.com. Uh, but also, uh, I, I respond very often to when folks messenger me on LinkedIn as well, right? And so... Uh, either way is totally cool. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you again for joining me here. And uh, it's been a pleasure. And I look forward to uh, reading your book and continuing to follow and, and see what you're up to next. Hopefully well, we'll have you back in, a, in another year or two. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And audience, thank you for being here with us on The Money and You Show. We uh, are going to show up on ubngo.com uh, at seven o'clock on Mondays. And then from there, you can find us on all the podcast platforms that you might listen to or watch. Uh, you can also find us on the Limit Free Life YouTube channel and Facebook page and, uh, and now Roku, which is super fun. So thank you for being here. I hope you picked up a lot of great information today. And I really do hope that you will uh, take a look at the uh, high velocity digital marketing book. I think for any business owners, this uh, 
can be very, very helpful. And uh, yeah, for you career changers, I hope you paid attention to some of the interesting ideas around working for startups. And uh, love to talk to you more about any of that. Feel free to reach out to me, Michelle, at LimitFreeLife.com. And you can, of course, go to the LimitFreeLife.com website and pick up some free resources and some additional great information. So thanks so much. We'll see you next week.